I have a message today from the Lord. It's called, Don't Let the Bad Eat Up the Good. It was the same message that I preached on Wednesday, only it's just going to come out a little bit differently today. Can I get an amen? amen? Don't let the bad eat up the good. Say that with me. Don't let the bad eat up the good. Amen? Amen. You see, Jesus had real struggles and disappointments too. He had some of the pain and all of the disappointments, the discouragements that we have in the life we live in. He came before us and he lived in those struggles. And he had some good days and he had some bad days just like us. Can I get an amen? A little fun this morning. You know it's going to be a bad day when you hear the birds singing in the morning outside the window and you look out there and it's vultures. Amen? You know it's going to be a bad day when you turn on the morning news and they're, they're displaying emergency routes out of the city. That wouldn't surprise us now, would it? <laughs> no. Nobody laughed at that one. Because it's so real, it wouldn't really surprise us. You, you know it's going to be a bad day when your doctor tells your wife that she's allergic to ice cream. You know why? Because there's no more ice cream in the house. Okay, I'd rather be allergic to it myself so I knew I couldn't eat it, but I, I love ice cream, and now she can't have ice cream, and so it's not in the house. She needs to go buy ice cream, right? You know it's going to be a bad day when it costs more to fill up your car than it did to buy it. <laughs> it's going to be a bad day, man. <laughs> Here's one for you. You know it's going to be a bad day when your horn gets stuck on the highway when you're following 32 Hell's Angels. <laughs> it's going to be a bad day, right? <laughs> yeah. Never had that happen, but I just thank God that never happened. So I want to recap Wednesday slightly. I, I want to talk about something in, that happened in Genesis 41. And it was a dream that Pharaoh had, and, and Joseph is taking a part in this. And, and it says that it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by the river. And suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat. And they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. And Pharaoh didn't understand this dream, so he went to Joseph, and, and he asked Joseph to, to, uh, to tell him what this dream meant. And Joseph said there's going to be seven years of good harvest in Egypt. And he said after that, there's going to be seven years of serious drought. And that's these skinny cows. It's the gaunt cows. That means skinny. The skinny cows coming and eating up all of the fat cows. Can I get an amen? So what I want to talk about is the good days. The fat cows are the good days, and the skinny cows are, are the bad days that we have in our life. And all of us in life will have good times and bad times. And in this dream, the skinny cows ate up all the fat cows. And if we're not careful, we allow that to happen in our own lives. We allow the bad times to eat up our good times. Can I get an amen? Has that happened to anybody here? We begin to take on a belief system that, that will tire us out. And that's what the spirit of Antichrist that we see moving all across this planet, that's what it wants to do. It wants to tire out God's children. Amen? It wants to defeat you. When we allow those bad days to eat up the good days, it, it begins to start to defeat us. And we've seen a lot of people across this country and across this world, we do ministry all over this all over this globe, we see a lot of people that have lost hope. They've given up. They've, they've thrown their faith down. Okay, All the bad days that they've had, they didn't store up enough of the good things to, so that they could defeat the bad days. Amen? Some have given up altogether, and that's what the system wants. It wants you to give up. It wants you to be frustrated and give up. Can I get an Amen. But this Bible teaches us how to think and how to react during the good times and during the bad times. Amen? It teaches us 
what to do in the good and what to do in the bad. Not just in the good times, but the bad times too. You know God wants you to finish this race. Can I get an amen? Are we in a race? God wants us to finish this race. He wants you to be a winner. He wants you to be a testimony of his glory. So we can't get up, give up before the end comes. Amen? The devil only wants to highlight the things that bother us. Anybody experience that? The little things. He wants to highlight those things. He wants to pinch you with those things. Amen? He wants those things to come to your mind before the good things. He wants to highlight those in your life. He wants to devour the good in your life, the things that are pure, the things that are a blessing to God. He wants to, he wants to devour the promises that God has given us. Amen? There's promises in this book. Okay, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. We share, we share how there's, there's four requirements for three promises. Amen? And God, when, when we fulfill our requirements, and we can't when we're just walking into bad things, when we fulfill our requirements, we see God working. We see God working. I love it. You know, being the pastor of this church, I see God working in each and every one of you. I get testimonies of how God has done mighty things, miraculous things, how he's blessed you in your lives. Amen. So I'm blessed to be able to see all that. Yes, I see the bad days too, but then I watch how the bad days get turned around because how many knows we serve a God that wants to turn the bad into good. Amen. Yeah, go ahead and give him a clap. It says in 1 Timothy 4, 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed. Okay, that means they give up. They give heed and they give up to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. That means those that once served the Lord... Those that once walked with the Lord will give up to those deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. You see, those, those, those lies of hypocrisy are, are those that are willing to embrace sin and falsehood just to, 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 to please their pride. Amen. To, pre, to please the own sin in their life. Amen. To justify their own sin. They no longer feel the conviction of the Lord. Amen. It says having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. No longer do we do we feel the conviction of the Lord. And that's our spiritual immune system just like our body has this immune system. Conviction is so important. We cannot allow our conscience to be seared. We have to always feel the moving of the Holy Spirit. We always have to feel his presence. So if we don't feel conviction, that we're not walking with the Lord. Amen? Then it goes on and it says, forbidding to marry and commanding forbidding to marry. Let me read this. Married households, when I was born, was 80% of households were married when I was born. In 2022, 49% of households are married. Amen? We had a we had a marriage here yesterday. It was awesome. Um, Arthur and Glenessa, uh, they got married here yesterday. Yes, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We need to have solid marriages back in the church again. Amen? Married households. But it says here in the end times that people, people will give up being married, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And I always looked at this, and I talked about it last night on 714, but I always looked at this like, what does this food thing mean in, in this verse? We're talking about the end times and what's going to happen, and I don't know if Paul, even when he wrote this, knew exactly what, what the word, the inspired word meant when he wrote it down. But now what I see is I, I see everything that God gives us to bless us. I see the spirit of Antichrist and the people that are walking in that spirit. I see them beginning to take away everything that blesses God. Amen? And turn everything around to be man-made. So, so man can be 
in charge and God is no longer in charge. And I'm starting to see that with our food. We're starting to see food shortages and, and we're going to struggle with that. And we've talked about that. You need to be prepared for that over the, the late part of the summer and the early part of the fall. You need to be prepared for food shortages and I'm beginning to see where, where people are buying up farmland and they're trying to get farmers to stop farming it and we're trying to create cattle and things like that that are synthetic and we can eat synthetic man-made food instead of the food that God has blessed us with. Why would we do that when God has given us all of this food, all of these animals, he's blessed us with those to eat. It's because man no longer wants to be walking in the blessings of God. They want to walk in the blessings of man, and that's it. And that's the spirit of Antichrist. And that same spirit wants to wear you down. It wants to wear you down. So we need to recognize when that spirit comes to work in our lives. Amen? Amen. We, we face that every day. It's in the air, remember? I want us to take a lesson from Elijah. Elijah was a great prophet. Great prophet of God. Amen. And, and he'd seen mighty things happen. And, and he came up against Ahab and Jezebel. And Ahab and Jezebel were king and queen at that time and they were the worst recorded king and queens they had walked away from God the people of God no longer served them they walked away and they started to serve Ashura and Baal okay and these are false gods and Elijah Elijah was so so chasing after the Lord that he went even when all the rest of the prophets might have been hiding in caves and there was some a hundred prophets were hiding in the caves. But Elijah went to Ahab and Jezebel and said, you bring all of your greatest prophets of Baal and you bring them to Mar Mount Carmel and I'll, I'll, I'll challenge you to a duel. We'll both set off offerings to our God and my God will fulfill the promise that he's told me and I know your God is going to let you down. So there was 450 prophets of Baal that came to Mount Carmel that day. And, and Elijah showed up all by himself. And I can just picture it, probably the whole city, all of what used to be God's people, but they no longer serve the Lord. It kind of sounds like our society. We've walked away. Many have walked away from God, and we serve other gods. Amen? And now, now he sees all of these people that used to walk with him and serve the Lord with him that are now standing over with the prophets of Baal. So he says, you dig your, your altar, you dig your altar, and I'll dig mine. And they did that. They, they cut up a calf. They put the firewood down, and they, they put the calf on the altar. And Elijah did the same thing on his side. And he said, now call down your God. And all those 450 prophets began to call down their God. And they began to pray and pray and pray, and they prayed for three and a half, four hours, and nothing happened. They were calling down fire on their offering. They were calling their God to burn up the offering that was given to them, and nothing would happen. And Elijah stood back, and he said, what y'all doing? I don't see anything happen over there. Where's your God? Was he taking a nap? Is, maybe he's going to the bathroom? Maybe he's up there reading a the book, not paying any attention to you. And I know, I know he stuck it to him pretty well. Elijah had great faith. He was waiting for his turn. He had great faith. And they continued to try and pray. They even cut themselves and sacrificed themselves trying to get their God to respond. And their God never responded. And Elijah said, now it's not my turn. And he said, I want you to go get a barrel of water. And I want you to pour that water over my altar. And he, and he had a ditch around there, and, and they poured water over all of that wood and that offering. And he said, now go get another barrel. And they poured another barrel out of it. And he's saying, you know, I'm setting you up for a win, but I know I'm going to win. And he said, you go get another barrel. And they, they went and got a third barrel, and they poured it over that altar. And all his offering was soaked with water. 
How many know you can't start a fire usually with something that's soaking wet, maybe lying in a puddle, amen? And Elijah called on Jehovah, okay, the real God. He called on Jehovah, and he asked God to, to shoot fire down on that altar. And, the, and our Lord shot fire down on that altar, and it consumed everything there that day. And that day, Elijah and the Lord beat 450 prophets of Baal, amen. He had this huge victory. Could you imagine that? Imagine that. Going up against a whole city, having the faith to call on your God to do something like that, and he did it. Woo! Imagine that. Imagine how you'd be flying. Well, the next day, Elijah got a letter from Jezebel, probably brought by a courier that said, I'm going to take your head. I, I'm going to cut your head off. And Elijah became discouraged. He became depressed, okay? He went from an amazing victory straight to a meltdown. I mean, Elijah melted down, amen? From a fantastic high, he was way up here, can you imagine, to this treacherous low now. He felt despair in his life. He went from the highest mountain down to the lowest valley, just like that in a day's time. Well, let's examine why for a moment. You see, Elijah was exhausted. And sometimes, you know, to, to walk through this world, we get exhausted. You know, sometimes to serve the Lord, it takes energy. To be concerned about souls, it takes energy. We fight that battle day in and day out. Amen? And when we're tired, we set ourselves up. And we have to beware when we become tired. We don't have a lot in the tank, you know. I remember when I was a kid and I had my little motorcycle. I used to ride it on the dike and, and I'd always run it out of gas, but I knew I had a reserve tank. It didn't have enough gas in it to, to drive around anymore, but I, if I flipped that switch, I usually had enough gas to get home. And if I messed around on the way home, I would burn that gas up. And I would draw down the reserve, amen? I would draw it down. And that's what the enemy wants to do in this life. He wants to drain us. He wants to tire us out. He wants to make us tire, so, tired so we'll only see the bad things and not the good things. Can I get an amen? God wants to put some good things into your life. But the devil wants you to see just the bad things. And we have to take the time to replenish Sometimes. Can I get an amen? We have to notice when that happens and say, God, I just need to renew my strength. I need to replenish myself. That might be the time that we need to get down on our knees and say, you are worthy. You are worthy, Lord. Move in this vessel. Strengthen this vessel. Secondly, Elijah was naive. He thought that after this great victory, everything would be perfect. He thought all his problems would be solved when he beat these prophets. But the truth is, there's still bad that is always going to want to come and get you, even after you have a big victory. Amen? There will always be mountains and valleys in this life that we live. Can I get an amen? But God wants to take us from victory to victory. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. And we need to realize that in our daily walk with God. Always realizing that he wants to take us from that victory to that victory. There might be some things happening in between, but God is there. He will get you through the valley and get you to your next victory. Can I get an amen? Elijah was avoiding responsibility. You see, Jezebel wanted his head. He just defeated 450 prophets. Why wouldn't God defeat Jezebel too? Why would he leave Elijah out, out to hang and flap in the wind when Jezebel was concerned? He ran from her, but he wasn't made to run. Elijah was made to stand. He was a prophet of God. He was made to stand. He was never made to run from those things. He had Jehovah standing alongside of him. He was meant to stand tall. Have any of you ever avoided God's will in your life and ran it'll wear you down 
When we run from where God wants us to be, it tires us out. It puts us in a bad place. It disappoints us. We become disappointed in that place. So we always want to stay where God wants us to be and not avoid the responsibility of who we are in Christ. Elijah withdrew. He retreated. He went a day's journey, the Bible says, from the wilderness. He pulled back from everybody. He disappeared. Can anybody relate to that? That's usually what happens when people become disappointed and, and they begin to get tired out. They begin to just slowly disappear. Slowly disappear. We see less and less of them. We'll talk about the body of Christ. We see less and less of them, and pretty soon we don't see them at all. Amen? They just sneak out and sneak out and sneak out. The next thing you know, they're living in the wilderness. They're hiding. They're withdrawn. And then the enemy has separated them. And the enemy likes to attack when we allow ourselves to be separated from those that are serving God with us. Amen? Elijah began to have faulty th thinking. You see, he requested that, that God would make him die. This is the day after. The day after this victory, man. He should have still been, well, not pounding his chest, but bragging about his God. Amen? He requested to God that he might die. Don't be weary in your well-doing. Okay, don't get weary when you do those things and you get those victories. Don't get weary, amen? God wants you to continue to do that over and over, and that will build up your spirit. Can I get an amen? Don't get weary in those victories. Those victories might come in the form of, of you being a blessing to somebody, of you giving to something, of you doing something great at your job or in your family. Don't get weary. Keep doing those things, okay? That's how we build up that, that strength and that favor in God, amen? Don't quit. Don't let negativity corrupt your thinking. You see, that's what the enemy wants to do when you get those victories, when, when, you get, when you start to see things happening in people's lives and in your life. He wants to throw in that negativity into your life because that's how he knows he can steal everything that you've accomplished is with negativity. The next thing is faulty comparison. You see, he saw Jezebel's letter. So he, he began to question himself. Did I really win that battle? You see, Jezebel's here. She wants to take my head off. Did I really win that battle? And he began to doubt himself. His confidence got lower and lower. When God speaks to you, don't you ever second guess what he tells you. Can I get an amen? When he speaks to you, he's got something great for you. He's got something great for your life. And he will speak to you if you're listening. And we need to practice to listen to the Lord. And that's what we were doing before the word. At the end of worship, we were, we were practicing to listen to the Lord. To hear what he had to say to each and every one of us. Amen? Don't ever give yourself into doubt and second guess what God wants to do. We must see ourselves as God sees us. He made us in his, whose image? His image. He made us in his image. So when we delete God, we deplete ourselves. Amen? The next thing was a loss of creativity. You see, our creative spirit will begin to leave us when we get discouraged. When you become discouraged, uh, your creativity will be gone. Elijah didn't know what to do, so he ran to a cave. God would have gave him, gave him plenty of ideas and thoughts of what to do next and how to defeat Jezebel and how to bring glory to his name. But instead, Elijah ran to a cave. He didn't make us to live in a cave. Amen? One of the problems with this country now is too many Christians have been living in the cave. And now we, we start to feel this momentum of people are coming out of the cave and, and they're like, the sun hit them and it's like, whoa. Beginning to see. It's not so dark after all. Okay? There is some light out here. Okay? God, go ahead and move. My eyes are starting to get adjusted. I can start to see now. I can see clearly now. I can see the truth. 
God, keep moving. Keep moving in this place. God, I can see more better. I can hear you more better. More better. You get taunted on the front row again. If I start to preach bad, it's her fault. Okay? You see, that's what Elijah did. He started to blame others while he was in that cave. He started to blame the other people of God, the sons of Israel. They've forgotten all about you, Lord. They forgot all about you. It's their fault that I'm in this cave. Who's been in that cave before? I've been in that cave. Hallelujah. He exaggerated the negative. I'm the only one left, Lord. There's nobody else serving you here but me, Lord. And that's what the enemy wants, to think, wants you to think. That you're all by yourself. That you can't win this battle. You can't win this struggle. This country can't win this struggle. This country can't go into revival. This country can't be re redeemed because it's just you. It's just you. This church can't grow. This church can't go into revival because it's just me or a couple others. There's plenty of people out there that want to see God moving, that want to see revival, and that want to return to the Lord. Amen? It's not just you. He thought it was worse than it was. He should, have, he should have spoke to himself all the great things that God had done in his life before he ran to the cave, before he decided to withdraw and regret. He should have spoke all of those things that God had done previously in his life. And I know God's done some amazing things in your lives. I've seen it. I've heard it. Just like I said earlier, start speaking those things over yourselves. When you feel discouragement coming in, you start speaking the great things that God has done in your life. Alice is 97 years old. She can probably speak those things for days and days and days. And our testimonies ought to be something that we should be willing to share, even if it's just with ourselves. Share it with yourself. Can I get an amen? Finally, here's what happened. He went into self-pity. And the end result of discouragement is self-pity. And that's exactly where the enemy wants you to live. He wants you to live in self-pity. Amen? Here's a couple definitions. Pity is the capacity to enter into the pain of another in order to do something about it. That's empathy or pity. Self-pity is a crippling emotional disease that severely distorts our perception of reality. Pity discovers the need in others for love and healing and then creates speech and actions that bring strength. That's where we're supposed to be. We're supposed to have that empathy as Christians. We're supposed to be able to speak strength when we see somebody that needs that. Amen? Self-pity reduces the universe to a personal wound that is displayed as proof of significance. You see, some of you wear this badge on your chest, and it's self-pity. It's your wound. Amen? And you hold on to you, that, and you walk with that badge. It's not your badge of courage. It's your badge of self-pity. Amen? And that's where the enemy wants you to live, in this place of self-pity. God never called you to do that. He called you to lift those people out that live in that place, to be one that has empathy, amen, to always walk on higher ground. The devil wants you to walk on that low ground of self-pity. That's a horrible place to be. Pity is adrenaline for acts of mercy. Self-pity is a narcotic that leaves its addicts wasted and derelict. That's what self-pity does. It leaves you wasted and derelict. God has never done with anybody. You see, he went to Elijah and he started to speak to Elijah. He said, I want you to get up and I want you to refresh yourself. And if there's anybody here that's a little tired right now, it's okay if you stand up and refresh yourself. Amen. He wants you to refresh yourself day in and day out. He doesn't want you to wallow in that self-pity anymore. He wants you to look up to look up and see the vision that he has for you. 
Jeremiah 29, 11, he has a vision. He has a plan for you. He wants you to look up. If all we do is look down, we're never able to see it. And if we can't see it, we'll never accomplish it. And we'll always remain down here when the Lord wants us up here. Amen. He wants you to link up. He said, I want you to link up with some others, Elijah. And that's when he went out, he got, or Elijah, he went out and he found Elisha. Amen. He linked up. He started to pour into somebody. He started to invest in somebody. He realized, I'm stronger with somebody else. I'm not going to sit here by myself and wallow in this self-pity anymore. I'm going to let the, the Lord use me Amen. and others with me. Amen. Psalm 31, 24 says, be strong and take heart. All you who hope in the Lord. 55.22 says, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be, new, to be moved. You see, God wants you to have the right perspective. It's all about perspective, folks. Amen? It's always a perspective issue. It's how we look at the whole picture. And God wants you to look at the entire picture, not just the negative parts, discouraged people will only look at the negativity we need to look at the positive ways and then God speaks to us and tells us how to move from there if all we do is look at the negative then obviously we are not going to get a download from the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit doesn't work with negativity God wants you to be persistent he wants you to have a persistent effort it's the most important thing in our lives is to be persistent in pursuing God. We have to always be stretching ourselves and giving ourselves to pursuing his presence day in and day out. That's when we overcome our failures, when we're persistent. Amen. Persistent in helping others. Persistent in doing what he called us to do. You see, success is won by people who have overcome great obstacles in their lives. Success is never accomplished by those that sat back and did nothing. It's never accomplished by those that were given a fortune and said, now go make it. You have to overcome some things. And God sometimes will allow us to get ourselves in positions of things that we need to overcome so that he can begin to work more and more in our lives. That's what makes us his image. God knows how to take care of all of those things. Amen. We keep on keeping on. It says in Mark 10, 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. You see, for all things are possible with God. You see, God wants to make your impossible possible today. Okay? He's not painting this, this huge picture that you can't accomplish. He wants to make your impossible Okay, the things that hold you back. He wants to make all of those things possible in your life. He doesn't want you to ever, 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 ever think about quitting. Don't ever think about quitting along the way. That's what the enemy wants you to do is quit. God is not never going to quit on you. So don't you dare quit on yourselves. Amen? Don't you dare. Come on now, that wasn't a very good amen. Don't you dare ever quit on yourselves. God has great things for you. Amen? Say it like you believe it. Say it like you believe it. First Corinthians 9.24 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And sometimes on the, on the race, during the race, we can get so winded, we can get so discouraged that the thought of quitting comes into us. We think about quitting, we think about we can't take another breath, our wind, it's gone, I'm tired, I have to stop. And I know professional runners, they get to that place too, even with a great condition, even in a great uh, physical condition. They feel like stopping sometimes. The pain can get so big in them. Their chest, their lungs can have that pain in them. I know you've all been there. And, and the enemy wants us to stop in this race. Okay? He wants us to stop in this spiritual race. But every runner that runs to win these races knows 
even when I, when I want to quit so bad, he knows there's a second win coming. He knows that he'll get his second win. Has anybody ever got a second win before? Yes, it comes when you need it the most. And that's what God always does when we feel like quitting. He gives us that second win, amen. And I believe that's what he's doing in this country right now and in these churches across this country as he's bringing a second win, a second win of the Holy Ghost into these churches, into his Christians now. We felt like quitting. We felt like giving up. It happened to you. It happened to me, but here we stand, and God is going to give us this great second win to help us to finish this race. Can I get an amen? amen. Good runners never stop short of the second wind. Never stop the second wind. Mark Twain said this. He said, I can live for two months on one good compliment. Yeah, yeah. just give me a compliment. You'll help me out so much. Get around people that will pick you up. Don't spend your time with the people that want to quit. Don't spend your time with the people that live in negativity. Don't spend your time with those people that are hanging out with the Antichrist system. Get around the people that are going to pick you up, encourage you, and invest in you. Can I get an amen? Get around the Word. Get around Jesus. Don't spend time in front of the TV. Grandma used to call it the boob tube. Don't spend time in front of the boob tube, okay? Spend time in the Word. Did I say something bad? Okay, good. I don't know why they called it that, but spend time around Jesus, amen? When you're feeling discouraged, spend time around the Jesus. Don't let the enemy throw gas on the fire that he's trying to destroy you with. Psalm 23. Almost done, folks. If you got a Bible, turn to Psalm 23. <clears throat> One of the most popular verses in the Bible. Many people have memorized this. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. We need to give him that. Lord, you're my shepherd. I shall not want. We need to give it to him. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. Hmm. He wants you to lie down with him. He wants you to rest with him. He leads me beside the still waters. Not the angry waters but the still waters, okay? That still water, if you stop and think about it, I, I always wanted a crick running through my backyard. I've never had a crick, but I, I can just imagine a nice slow crick, still waters, not a rushing water. I like rushing water too, but I could just imagine, you know, always being able to sleep with the windows open to hear a crick just moving along. And that's what David is trying to paint a picture of, is just you relaxing. You relaxing. And, and, and let, the, let the Holy Spirit move and take control in your life. It says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Who wants to be righteous? I want to be righteous in, this last, in these last days. I want God to use my life. I want him to use you. I want us to be righteous. Amen. Amen. Revival is always full of righteous people. Amen. I believe that righteousness is going to return to our schools. I believe that righteousness is going to return to many places that we already thought about giving up with. I believe it. Then it says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then it says here in verse 5, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. And the trouble is, is we have to have this spiritual discipline to be able to sit down at the table that God has prepared for us in the middle of our trouble. 
in the middle of our enemies. But that's what he says I want you to do. I want you to sit down in the midst of all this trouble, in the midst of all this chaos. I want you to sit down, but that's not the first thing that we think about as people walking in the flesh to do. Amen? He says, I want you to have a feast in the middle of difficult circumstances. And to some of us, it just doesn't make sense. Why would, why would we relax and feast while our enemies surround us, while our enemies want to take us out? Why would we sit and relax and enjoy a feast? Amen? Who actually does that? God is saying, in the middle of stressful situations, in dangerous times, in discouraging times, in those heart-wrenching moments when something happens that sends you down to a valley, in those heartbreaking circumstances, and we all experience those in lives, those heartbreaks. He says, I want you to sit down with me. I want you to sit down. That's the problem is many people, they, they won't sit down with me in the middle of their trouble. I want you to relax with me. I want you to spend time with me. I want you to enjoy my presence in the middle of all of that because if I've got you, even in the middle of everything else that is happening in this world, if I got you, that's when you can have peace. Amen. That's when you can get strength. Amen. That's when I'll renew your strength. Amen. That's, that's what will happen when you sit with me in the middle of all that. So we're just going to sit here for a bit. We're going to sit here and enjoy each other's presence and company for a bit. And then I'll walk you through it. That's what he's saying. I'm going to walk you through it. But I can't walk you through it if you don't sit down with me for a few minutes. You see, God wants to prepare a feast in the middle of all of our enemies. You know, he wants you to sit down at the table. He wants you to enjoy what he set there for you. All the blessings that God has for you. He's saying, they're right here. You just need to sit down and, and enjoy these. Take a look at all these beautiful blessings I have for you at the table. It's okay. Your insecurity, your fear, your discouragement, your setbacks, all of those things, they're sitting here watching you. But right in the middle of all that, I'm going to give you this feast. I'm going to prepare for you a table. My insecurity isn't at the table. My fear isn't at the table. But I'm standing in front of them. Okay, Elijah finally got it. He finally got it. He finally listened to the Lord, and the Lord moved awesomely in his life from there out. And he wants to do the same thing for you. He wants you to, to sit at the table with, with him. He wants to give you this feast in the presence of your enemies. How awesome is that? The people that talk bad about you. The people that don't believe in you. Amen? The, the people that don't believe in me, God says. All of those people, the people that want to criticize you for who you are. He says, I'm setting you a table. I'm creating this great testimony in front of all of those unbelievers. He's pouring his spirit out. He's pouring it out about with those that are willing to sit down at his table in the middle of everything. That's us, folks. That's us. He wants to dine with us, and he wants the world to watch. He wants everybody to have a place at this table. Everybody. But if they got to watch for a while, let them watch. But let them watch what God does for you in your life. Don't ever let discouragement take a place at the table that God has set for you. Amen? Can I get a piano up here, please? Don't, don't ever, some musicians, don't ever let, let discouragement sit at this table with you. Don't ever let your, your circumstances sit at this table with you. God is saying, I have this place. It's just for you. I'll sit down with you. It's just for you and me. It's not for all those enemies. Okay? Sometimes we're our own worst enemy. Sometimes our thoughts are our worst enemy. 
But we need to learn to start to speak over our thoughts, you see. And we can speak one way or another. We can either speak bad over those thoughts or we can speak good over those thoughts. Let's learn to speak, let's learn to flip the script like God wants to flip the script in our lives. Amen? I remember when I first got married and my wife said, I want you to sit down at the table. I've prepared a feast for you. And out came the hamburger helper. <laughs> hey, we were young. We didn't have a lot. Hamburger helper, is that still around? That was good, really. But sometimes it come out a little crunchy. <laughs> I said, honey, this is good. This is good. What's that smell? I remember during COVID, we had COVID and we couldn't smell or taste. And the house got full of smoke before we realized the toasted cheese on the oven or on the stove got burnt and crisp. Couldn't smell nothing. We weren't, we weren't in tune. But when we sit down at the table of God, when we sit down in, in the presence of our enemies, in front of our enemies, you see, you all are my enemies right now. I have a lot of enemies. You all are all my enemies. Not really, but let's just pretend. I could sit here and have a feast, and that's what God wants to do in your life. He wants you to have a feast in front of your enemies. I believe he's speaking to each and every one of us about, first of all, His presence more tightly. Just giving it to Him more and more. He wants you to do that more and more. He wants you to practice that. Maybe it's hard for you right now. Practice it, practice it, practice it. Amen. You'll get better and better and better. Amen. That's how God works. Keep practicing, keep getting in the Word, keep, keep praying, uh, keep speaking those great things over your relationship with Him. You'll get better and better and better start to hear him more and you'll start to see more so you can be more and then he wants you when when trouble comes and don't think it's not going to come when trouble comes he wants you to sit down at the table with him slow yourselves down slow your life down sit down at the table with him and enjoy what he has for you amen enjoy what he has he he has so many different things so many different things what is that is it artichoke? He's got artichoke. He's got all of this for you. And that's what he wants you to do. He wants you to feast on him and his presence. Amen? Bow your heads with me. Father, we just thank you for your word here today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that you walked everywhere that we have to walk. Lord, you did everything that we have to do except we don't have to go to the cross. We thank you, Lord, that you went to the cross for us. You gave your life for us, Lord, so that we could sit at the table. Lord, I pray if there's anybody in this place that, uh, that has never come to you and sat at your table, that's never given their life to you, I pray that in a moment they'll respond to you and your goodness and they'll respond to salvation the way you intended it, Lord. Salvation is the greatest and best gift that we could ever have. All of these things at the table, Lord, we thank you for those, but salvation is the greatest gift ever. If you're in this place today and, and you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never said, Jesus, thank you for coming, going to the cross, and, and Lord, I want you to come into my life. I want to I wanna make a decision today to live for you. I want to begin to experience life the way you've experienced, but I, I want salvation 
And because of you, because of your blood, because of your sacrifice, I can experience that. If that's you and you want to do that today, I just want you to slip up your hand in this place. It's not an embarrassment to ever come to Christ. It's a privilege. It's eternity. Amen. If that's you, slip up your hand in this place. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, we thank you, Lord, for, for what you've done. And I, I thank you, Lord, for what your word says and what the Holy Spirit just spoke to us. Lord, I, I know there's people here that have been struggling with discouragement. I know we live in this world that only wants us to see that. Lord, I pray that we will learn to walk through and recognize those things that want to take us out from your will, that we won't let the bad eat up the good in our lives. We'll stop doing that, Lord. I pray over each and every person, Lord, we will no longer focus on the bad and allow the bad to consume the good. There's way too much good. You've created us for the good, Lord, so we will no longer allow ourselves to, to allow the bad to consume the good. Lord, that we'll, we'll listen to your voice, and when you've called us to the table, God, we'll come and sit at the table. We'll come and sit with you in the presence of our enemies. Our enemies need you, Lord. Our enemies need you. Lord, our own personal spiritual enemies, Lord, they need to go. And when we sit at the table, they go. They can't come sit with us. If you want to get with God at the table, I'm going to open the altar up and we're just going to worship for a few minutes and, and allow God to move in here. If that's you, if you want to come up to this altar... I said yesterday in the wedding, the altar is a place where big decisions are made. Where we put God in the middle of our decisions. If you want to put God in the middle of your decision and make one for him today, the altar will be open. It's also a place that we worship and we give thanks to him. It's where we acknowledge him and we give him glory. The altar will be open for both those reasons. And if that's you, I, I want you to go ahead and come up. If not, Lord, I pray a blessing over each and every person here. Lord, I pray that you just go with them, bless them, keep them, encourage them, Lord. Lord, let this word resound in their life. Let them look back to it. Every word spoken. I pray they be in the word, God. And that together, we end up world changers. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen, amen. Come to the altar if you need the Lord.